Hollywood. And uh, we're going to get our 70s rock on in a big way in just a few minutes. Right. Because we're going to be talking with Dave Lewis, the uh, leading Led Zeppelin aficionado, I the will say, and amazing. historian. He's he is amazing. He's unbelievable, this guy. Uh, and his new book is called Led Zeppelin Feather in the Wind Over Europe 1980, which documents the In Through the Outdoor Tour, which was their final tour before John Bonham's passing. We're going to get to all of that shortly, but right now, to put you in the mood. Oh, very nice. <laughs> that was uh, Led Zeppelin's Achilles' Last Stand from Mannheim, Germany, uh, the final Zeppelin tour uh, in 1980. And the reason that we were playing a little bit of that is because on the line with us is the preeminent Led Zeppelin historian and also author of the book Feather in the Wind, Europe 80, which chronicles the, uh, the final Led Zeppelin tour. Mr. Dave Lewis, good morning to you, my friend. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Excellent, excellent. We really appreciate you uh, you waking up. I know uh, we're talking to you in England. Well, we want to get into the into the book and talk some Zeppelin. But before we do that, one thing we always like to ask our guests is, what have you been listening to lately? What's in your CD player these days? Um, okay, well, quite unsurprisingly, quite a lot of Led Zeppelin. Fact, <laughs> really? Of Zeppelin. <laughs> really? Shock, 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 come on, guys. Uh, you caught us totally off guard with that one. Oh, I thought I would do, but it's, <laughs> been, it's, uh, it's been Led Zeppelin bootlegs, actually. Um, there's a two CD set called Hot August Night which is from a gig at Fort Worth in August 1971 uh, they were just on fire that night right. uh, predictably a few from the uh, uh, Over Europe tour huh? uh, there's one called uh, Tour Over Europe 1980 which is the Zurich gig which is a tremendous uh, recording from a soundboard uh, the Berlin Complete Last Show I've had that on when they right. do extraordinary versions of um, Stairway and Whole Lot of Love uh, big vinyl collector, so uh, Cologne, I was at that gig, uh, I've got the two LP vinyl from that, that's been on. Uh, I do play loads of vinyl, uh, The Who's Next, uh, nice. I've had that on. Uh, I've just written a 15,000 word 40th anniversary feature on The Who's album, Who's Next, that's just going in uh, Record uh, Collector magazine uh, in about three or four weeks. So. The Who's been on, uh, The Faces have been on, uh, the album Ooh La La. Nice. Nick Drake, Pink Moon, Lonnie Stones Black and Blue, uh, David Bowie, Young Americans. Wow, you're uh, busy. Alice Cooper, Love It to Death, which I recently got on original US Warners. Um, finally on a trapeze album, um, which is called You Are The Music, We're Just A Band, which features Glenn Hughes. A great uh, record. I saw yeah, I saw Glenn a couple of weeks ago with Black Country Communion when they played the High Voltage Festival, and uh, he was just fantastic. Yeah. So, a lot of stuff going down, as there always is around this around this park. Right. Dave, how many Zeppelin bootlegs do you have? <laughs> um, it's in the region of about a thousand, I think. That's uh, great. It, that is fantastic. It, it's pretty ridiculous. I've That's got, great. I've got all the original vinyl, um, I, you know, I, I've still got all of that, and then the CDs, when the CD explosion started in the early 90s, I just collected everything. Um, it's, it's probably waned off in the last few years, obviously now, you know, with the internet and with the downloads and such like, you know, uh, there's not such a need, uh, you know, to have, right. you know, all the packaging and what have you, but I, I've got access to uh, most of the bootlegs that have come out, and there's been a lot, and I've got lots of different versions of different things, and right. it's quite ridiculous. <laughs> it has cooled down a bit in recent years, but, uh, you know, it is a good archive, and it's always, you know, it's fantastic to have uh, all this, uh, you know, this sort of fingertips, especially when you need it. Yeah. Uh, when I'm doing my books, and certainly for the Europe book, it was great to go back to all those gigs that I've got um, on CD right. and record. I'm I'm a I'm a big bootleg collector myself and and have quite a quite a bit of Zeppelin not quite as much as you though but uh, yeah there there are certainly some standout shows and some standout tours and um, yeah well like like you mentioned the Zurich show is is probably one of my favorites from the the 1980 yeah, tour yeah. but to be fair I don't know as a as a, a a Zeppelin bootleg listener and aficionado I don't know that 1980 is is necessarily my favorite uh, my favorite era of live shows from Zeppelin. So right off, what what's your thoughts on that, and what was yeah, your favorite it's, tour? It's an interesting it's an interesting point because with the whole eighty tour, uh, you know, it is as I've you know sort of dubbed it the tour that time forgot with Led Zeppelin. Um, it came at the end of their career. It came after their book. It came in a period of when they were looking to rejuvenate, and, and particularly in England, there was a backlash against them because of the punk rock explosion and what have you. So. It, it was a bit of a weird tour, but, um, you know, I was lucky enough to be there at five of the shows, and I know how good it was when they were good. 
and when they were good, they were still as good as it gets. But what happened with the 80 tour, in the early 90s, a lot of soundboard tapes came out that were very flat sounding uh, and, and went onto bootlegs and, and didn't really do it justice. Um, that's probably got better over the years with you know more versions that have come out but uh, i think again that didn't help the whole sort of mystique of the europe thing but now there's some great audience tapes and and there is some fantastic nights I and mean, i can point you to zurich i can point you to frankfurt i can point you to cologne uh, you know those nights led zeppelin was still on fire in a very different way to what they had been previously but all the ingredients chemistry that was there you know in 68 and 69 was still there led zeppelin had had places to go and i think one of the reasons for doing the book was to highlight that and to highlight the almost sort of poignancy of the fact that they weren't allowed to go on and do that you know with the sad death of john bonham in right. uh, three months after the show so i think one of the things with you but is to try and bring it into focus and it was the last days of led zeppelin um yes there were things going on they weren't as um healthy as they had been in previous years in in quite a lot of ways and and i think they were at a crossroads uh, which is why again it's a great um book to do because you are speculating what might have happened and right. on, on you know any given night in europe there was enough indication to suggest that they could have gone into the 80s and 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 still been a very huge force i think particularly in america that would have been a problem uh, but in england things were changing you know you had the new wave of heavy metal you know uh def leppard you know iron maiden the, the, these fans were coming through and zeppelin fans were getting a bit fed up with waiting because there was nothing going on you know they did two gigs at nedworth and then nothing and then to go to europe they still missed england now what they needed to do after that was to come back here and, and do Five Nights at the Rainbow or wherever and show that they could still be a working band. I think if they'd have done that, then there would have been a whole lot of new era, you know, for Led Zeppelin in the 1980s. So right. that's one of the great things about the book. I think it does really bring that out. Right. Well, before the before this tour even begins, I just wanted to go back to, uh, as you said, 1979 Nebworth, which um, for for me, I, I remember that weekend, even though I wasn't I wasn't in England, but even on local radio stations in Los Angeles, it was like there was a happening. There was something going on, and it was big. And I uh, <laughs> wished, wished I could have been at, at Nebworth, but... Um, uh, we know you also have a, another book that you've written just on the Nebworth Festival, yeah, so I want yeah. to mention that also. And what was the significance of that show, those two well, shows? Again, it's, it's incredible to think how much had moved on from Nebworth to when they played in Europe, because in England the musical climate, even in ten months, was moving on. But when they played at Nebworth, there was a huge acclaim for them from their following. I mean, you know, nearly 200,000 people came over the two weeks. It was a massive event. Uh, I mean, in my book, uh, you know, again, I do say it's the last great sort of concert of the 70s. And I think Led Zeppelin came out and strode that and, and, you know, under a lot of pressure. I mean, they had a lot to lose. They hadn't paid in two years. And, that, and they did fantastically well to come back in the way they did. It was a massive show, massive light show, right. massive screen. And, you know, they pulled it off. I mean, you know, musically, it was, you know, a little bit ragged here and there. But when, again, when it was good, you know, in the evening was fantastic. Um, Killies, etc. You know, they really did. And over those two weeks, I think they did a lot to um, to put themselves right back in there. Uh, and and you know, the acclaim was good. Even the press wasn't too bad. I mean, you know, they were slaughtered in some circles, but you know, they were up for that. But it wasn't really about the press. It was about the fans. And I think what they've done is say look this is us we can still do it you know um into the outdoor came out and sold fantastically well uh which and i thought it was a great album you know there was enough in there again to say yeah you know we can still do stuff and go places you know things like uh carousel amber and you know so i think the whole element will ends up being at nebworth was that yes we're back but what they didn't do and what they failed to do after that was really capture that moment if they'd have gone on tour towards the end of the year say and played you know a few days around england i think that would have really cemented the success of them but it didn't and they just hung around a bit you know what we're going to do where we're going to play and in the end peter grant decided to take them to europe a tactic they've used quite a lot over the years right back to 68 when their first ever gigs were in europe and i think he wanted to shy them away from the press to set up to go back to america because the other stumbling block they had was robert plant didn't really want to go back to america right. at that time because the tragedies that had you know befell him in 77 um you know when his child died and they're on tour and all the stuff with the backstage stuff at oakland there was a heavy 
cloud over that and, and they had to get rid of that cloud so I think to go to Europe and do that and again you know when you read the book and you find out the story of Plant getting very strong he was real strong on that tour he was very confident again in a different way but I think that gave him the confidence to say yeah we need to go back because if Led Zeppelin were going to be a working band they had to go to America right. because a sizable amount of their audience was in America right. and that tour that tour that was set up in, in, in you know for the fall I think they would have gone back and again fairly easily replay their audience probably easier than they did in England because in England the climate was a lot different in America you were still you know obviously Van Halen bands like that had come through but Zeppelin I think would have taken it again by the scruff of the neck when they got to America and right. then built on that to come back to England and go to other territories so <clears throat> a very strange time but I, I, I think Nebworth you know in effect set them back up what they needed to do was cash in on it quickly yeah well one of the things that you, you just said uh, ironically uh, about the the American audience and the anticipation for Led Zeppelin was more on the money than you realize. I went back and, and did a little uh, poking through some, some old date books and ticket stubs, and this is what I, I found out. On September 20th of 1980, I was at the Los Angeles Sports Arena for Van Halen on the Women and Children First Tour, and, right. and I have a distinct memory of as everybody was filing out of that show and everybody was pumped and excited that we just saw a great Van Halen show, everybody was cranking the, lo the local radio station from the car uh, in the parking lot, and the the whole the whole parking lot was buzzing not about Van Halen but the fact that they were just announcing Zeppelin were coming and that was the big excitement that night um, and of course four days later was uh, was when Bonham passed away and it wasn't to be no I, I, again I can no doubt about it there was a sense from the fans that I was in touch with at the time in the U S that you know everyone was waiting you know there was this you know we'd had Nebworth uh, and uh, and then they played in Europe and I think you know the whole you know if you look at it uh, it's really funny because when they played in 77 it was still massive you know they played to nearly a million people over those gigs and I right. know it out in a very sad way but you know they, it almost got chopped in its prime again you know over in America in 77 so I think the fans were ready to you know embrace them again uh, and I think there was a great sense of that so as you rightly say even though different things were happening you know in America new bands were coming through you know the prime one is probably Van Halen they didn't have the obstacles of the press out there that they got in England. They didn't have the obstacles of the, the punk and new wave backlash. You know, not that Led Zeppelin ever didn't embrace that, because they did. Right. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, to go to America in that September, um, in October, November, when they were going to tour, it would have been the reclaiming of, you know, their territory, if you like. And I think Jimmy, in particular, was up for that. I mean, there's a piece in the book which you probably read. I had this incredible situation where a week before John Bonham died, I was in the Swanson office, and Jimmy was in there. And, you know, I had it's an amazing one-on-one -on -one audience with him for about half an hour. And they had a model set up uh, of how the stage was going to look on the 80 tour, and like, wow. the amp set up. And, the, and I was looking at this, and Jimmy is talking to me, and he's enthusiastic, you know, he's <laughs> saying we're going to do this. You know, so for me as a fan, you know, and, and I was going to go to America. I mean, I was, wherever they were going to play at that point, I was going to try and get there. So, right. uh, you know, I was a crazed fan. You know, we were we were just kids, and we, you know, it, it was all about the next gig or the next pint of beer. Or right. yeah, you know, it was a long way from where we are now, and it's you know, it's, a, it's you know, it's a lifetime away. Although sometimes it feels just like a second. But, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you know, so you know, there was this incredible anticipation still, and and again, being in Europe and seeing those gigs, and we were so lucky because we had this incredible close proximity as you will read in the book I was at the right time at the yeah. right place you know and, and that is a story in itself L let me ask you quickly I know that uh, the 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 run in the states was going to be a, a very limited run right over those two months was there and when you had that even when you had that conversation with Jimmy was there ever talk of what maybe the bigger picture was to be well I think Initially, uh, again, I think Robert said I would go back to America, but only in bounce. He didn't want to do these long 33-day tours or whatever. Right. So when you look at the tour that was set up for the 80 tour, you know, it was a bout of gigs. It was come home. It was a second bout of gigs. Uh, I think that would have eased them in. Uh, they often did do touring like that, although it was still lengthy. You know, in America, when in 77, it was, you know, a three-leg tour. But... I think it was to go for three weeks, come back, three weeks, come back, and then that would have got them into 1981, and I think the plan then was to come to England and go back to territories they haven't been to, Japan, Australia, you know, because all of those, you know, areas um, had really grown up now, and the whole rock market was, you know, a lot bigger 
than it had been when they toured there in the early 70s. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of, as I say, ground to reclaim. But I, I definitely got the feeling around the camp at the time that going to America was a safe bet, if you like. You know, they knew that they weren't going to get slagged off. And if they got their act together uh, and, and really, you know, made it work and rehearsed hard and got back into it. Because I think the Europe tour had been a bit... It, there were good nights and not so good nights. You know, it started very well. Um, but, you know, they hadn't played consistently for so long. You know, you've got to remember, this was a band that had done four gigs in, you know, three years or something until right. they got to Europe. So I think what Led Zeppelin needed to do was to be a working band again. And that's when they were at their prime. I've just talked about listening to that 1971 on, you know, on that Fort Worth bootleg. Then they used to do it in their sleep because they played so often. You know, when they got to Europe, you know, it was suddenly, oh, Christ, you know, we've got to do 14 gigs in three weeks. We haven't done that for a while. Yeah. So, you know, you have to understand, I think there was a lot of misfortune that had gone on with Led Zeppelin, as we know, and, and lots of things that had happened. Up until 1975, you know, everything was great. Right. But the last four years, you know, their existence, or five, was, was a, a hard slog, uh, and they kept getting setbacks, and there was all stuff going on. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, again, I was very... Well, not close to it, but on the edge to it. And, you know, being in their office, I could sense, you know, this was a, a, a big thing that had got out of hand, you know, and I don't think anyone knew quite how to make the right sort of decisions. And, you know, n you know no central character than that, you know, than Peter Grant, I, I think, was, you know, difficult um, to deal with at that point. You know, obviously, you talk about the sex and the drugs that had gone on, and there was, you know, a lot of that going on, too. Right, right. So you put it all into the mix, all we wanted as fans was to see Led Zeppelin playing, you know, live on stage. So and, think, and playing and playing a long show too, because as you mentioned, seventy three, seventy one, even seventy five, this is when they were doing these three, three and a half hour marathon shows. They were playing frequently, they were playing often, they were stretching out. I don't think we would have ever had that live version of Dazed and Confused had they not been playing as often as and as long as, as we you know, we were getting them in seventy you know, the early seventies. Um, if they were playing as sporadically as they were around uh, presence or even uh, in through the outdoor, that that kind of that kind of extended jam, I don't think would have been a, a, a regular part of their repertoire. Um, well, that, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting point because I think one of the things about the Europe tour was that it was very different because there was no Zazie Confused, there was no Moby Dick, there was no big light show, there was no lasers. It was Led Zeppelin trying to be a working band again, and that was a huge thrill to watch. I can tell you, you know, I can remember vividly the first night, the first gig we saw, uh, June 18th, you know, Cologne, it was, we were underneath the uh, photographer's pit as close as you could be, and Jimmy walked on and stepped on the Wawa, and they did Train Kept to Rolling. Now, I hadn't played Train Kept to Rolling since 1969, and it was like, bang, you know, we can still do this. Uh, and so, to see a set that was, you know, very different from what I saw in 75, or 72, or, you know, it was different, but it worked very well. I think what they'd have done is taken the elements of that rejuvenation and that sharpness to America. I think they would have opened it up a bit. It would have been a longer show. I think, you know, it, I think the sort of halls they were playing dictated quite a big light show, because, again, during that era, that was, you know, part of what went on. So I think they would have opened it up. You may be right. I don't think there would have been 40-minute days to confuse. I don't think there'd have been... 40 minute drum solos. I, I can remember, um, you know, in 77, where that was a very long set, and I know fans that were there often said to me, oh, you know, when they did Moby Dick or No Quarter, you know, people would walk around, and, you know, it, it, I think the focus sometimes, because it was so long, was difficult for audiences to take in, and, you know, it was all a bit crazy anyway with firecrackers going off or whatever. Right, so right. I, I get the feeling that the Europe tour had toned up a, a lot of what they did best, which was the short, sharp, incisive riffing, the, you know, the, the real rejuvenated onslaught of Led Zeppelin when it was, you know, in 68, 69, it was like that. And I think if they combined that with some of the um, uh, longer pieces into America, then it would have been, you know, a really great set. I mean, one of the, you know, fun things to do, I guess, is to speculate what that set list would have been in September, right, of course. In the, you know, the fall of 80. So, but, the, you know, the thing is, they still had new places to go, and I think, again, the book really brings that out. You know, this wasn't a band that had reached the end, you know, their tether by any means. Led Zeppelin was still number one. All right. it needed to do was to go out there and prove it. Right. And one of the other great things uh, in the book, uh, besides besides the fact that I love that you go 
you know, uh, concert date by concert date through each of the shows, the history on the venue. They're, it's just packed with great information for people who really want to get under the uh, under the cover and, and you know really get into this subject yes. matter. Uh, but I love that you've also got um, firsthand accounts from people who who are at the shows, and especially towards the back where you have the um, all of the details on all the recordings, all the bootlegs. I, I love that kind of stuff and all the memorabilia, and uh, and the fact that you've got scans of and photos of some of the actual tickets that were sold for the U.S. tour. How many how yeah. many dates actually went on on sale? And am I right that people were actually in line for tickets when Bonham's death was announced? Oh, that very much happened. Um, what happened in Chicago, where I think it was the four four dates were announced in the Chicago newspaper, there was an um, there was an advert that you had to fill in to apply for tickets. So. Over the night of September the 24th, the issue was coming out, and all these fans queued outside the Chicago newspaper to get early copies so they could go away and fill in and apply for the tickets. So there was huge queues just for the newspaper. I mean, they had not anything else. Right. Uh, and all these queues were forming. I mean, quite ironically, just as the news was coming through, you know, that John Bonham had died. So guys had, you know, were ready to apply for their tickets, you know, and then, again, if you look in the book, there's a picture of, um, you know, all these guys outside Chicago. So those, those tickets went on sale. I mean, many years later, a lot of those tickets were sold for a mail order company. Um, so it was quite easy to get hold of original tickets. I think they're now much more scarce. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those banks of tickets that you see that we reproduced were, were, I think there was a company that did them, I think it was in the early 90s, um, and you can actually get those. But they're much you know, scarcer now, but they are pretty historic because the tickets for a Led Zeppelin show that never occurred. Right. Um, but the, as I said, the irony is this situation in Chicago, where, and they were the first dates put on sale, uh, where all these guys are, you know, have actually got what they need, the newspaper, and then to be told when you wake up in the morning it must have been, you know, really dreadful. Oh, devastating, right? Very sad. So, you know, just, it just wasn't to be. And speaking of shows that never happened, um, the the final night in Berlin, as I understand it, there was actually supposed to be a second night in Berlin, and a, and a common misconception is that Bonham died that night, and and that and that he didn't play. But of course, that happened actually several months later. What what actually happened to that second Berlin show? Well, I think there's a couple of things that happened. Um, quite remarkably, the dates didn't sell as well as they probably could have done. Almost by default, because they didn't actually publicise it a lot. There was nothing in England, um, apart from a couple of lines in, I think, Melody Maker saying they were on tour. Um, it was quite easy, bizarrely, on the night of the gigs to go in and actually get a ticket. Most of them were nearly sold out, but I think with Berlin, um, I think when they put the two on sale, they'd done two in Mannheim and then they went to Munich. Um, and I think... Whether they felt they weren't going to sell it, I'm not sure. It, 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 I don't think I have, I've actually got a solid answer on that. I think, also, I think there was um, there was one element that they're all going back on holiday um, when they came back. I know certainly John Bonham was away in France, and I'm, it may just have not, you know, fitted in, you know, to the schedule. But um, the gigs themselves, because they weren't publicised that well, it was quite an easy way of you know, going to see Led Zeppelin. I think there's um, one of the stories in the book from. One of the fans that went, he went to the Mannheim show, thought it was fantastic, and then got a ticket for the next night quite easily outside the venue. Whereas, you know, had it been in 77 or, or wherever in America, getting a ticket was, you know, incredibly difficult. Um, right. But it was such a low-key tour, you know, again, for, you know, for me to be on the side of the stage, you know, a Led Zeppelin show, it, that, you know, that couldn't have happened in Madison Square Garden, and it probably right. couldn't have happened, you know, in Earl's Court. But because it was so relaxed, and, and they were trying to do it a different way. The entourage had been cut down substantially. You know, they had the road crew, a few record company people. It was nothing like, you know, what, uh, you know, had been before. So I think there was an element, uh, and again, I go back to that, you know, slogan, the tour that time forgot. It, it almost was because, you know, we, we came back to England and there wasn't any press. I mean, there was one press review. The Melody Maker came out to do the Munich show. You know, had that been three or four years earlier, you know, you'd had, you know, the enemy had been there, Rolling Stone had been there, you know, right. and all this. So, you know, again, different days. Uh, and again, one of the reasons I'm so pleased that the book, you know, is out there, I, I think it documents better than anything the final days of Led Zeppelin, you know, and, right. and that's going to be, that's always going to be, it's not going to change, you know, that, that, that is for all time what happened on the last tour. Uh, as much information as I could put in from people who were there and, and you know, the fact I was there 
And it, it tells almost my story as well, I guess. There's a lot, quite sure. a lot of the fact that I was so lucky to be right in the middle of Led Zeppelin's, you know, whole, you know, sort of shebang. It was exactly. Like, you know, I, I was, you know, 23 years old, and it was like, crikey, how has this happened? You know, <laughs> and I had great access, you know, I really did, and, and they were fantastic to me. I can't, you know, it was an amazing period of my life. And again, to document that, you know, and, and all those pictures you see um, were taken by, you know, my colleague Tom, who was with me, from the side of the stage, and it's, you know, you don't see pictures like that on on any other Led Zeppelin tour. We were just so lucky, and I think again that um, really captures, you know, the whole you know sort of atmosphere of what was going on then. So. You know, it's real good. Right. Well, you you certainly were in an enviable position to be there during those days. And uh, during one of those uh, those last few shows, uh, I want to say it was on the 27th of June, I believe, that Bonham collapsed on stage and, uh, and had to be uh, rushed, rushed away from the gig. Was that an indication of things to come? Well, not really, no, because what happened, um, I, I can tell you when we got there, um, the atmosphere was very strong, everyone was up the, um, you know, and, you know, the, it, it was, you know, a really good atmosphere, but we, we went to Cologne and came back, uh, and then went back again and picked the tour up in Frankfurt, and John Bonham had collapsed um, three days before that. Um, but it was very much, oh, he's okay, you know, he's just overeaten, which is what it was. He, he had all, all these faulty bananas, or what, whatever the story is, <laughs> right. um, to keep his energy up. I can tell you that the whole time we, we were around it, they all looked great. And, and, and you know, there wasn't um, any sense that John, you know, wasn't strong or, or was, you know, you know in, in any way a bad way. We chatted to him. The only thing I can tell you... Uh, as on every tour, he was pretty homesick, and we had a conversation with him, you know, in one of the hotels where he was just saying, oh, I'm looking at going back and, you know, seeing Zoe and Jason, and, and, you know, he was always a family man, and that, I think, was the thing that played on his mind a lot, is that he, he really didn't want, again, the long tours, I think, again, he was someone uh, who didn't like that, but the other thing he didn't want to do was let down the others, you know, there was a great right. sense of loyalty amongst the four of them, that they, they'd done this for so long, Nobody wanted to be the one to say, you know, it's over. And I don't think the family was over, but I, I think, no, I would say the link to the collapse was not um, an indication of, you know, his health. I think what happened in September was a pure misfortune. You know, John Bonham drank a lot, you know, lots, lots of people did and still do. He was unfortunate that on one binge he didn't wake up. And, you know, I don't think it was about the fact that he wasn't well in Europe. That was an isolated incident, which they got over very quickly, because the next right. gig, uh, they played great, you know, and the shows that we saw after that, um, in Frankfurt, Mannheim, Munich, and John Bonham was on peak form. So, yeah, I think it was just a blip, but Led Zeppelin had lots of blips, you know, they seemed to be the band that had blips, you know. When right. we got there and they told us about it, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't that shocked. I thought, here we go, it's another... It's another one to get over, but, you know, they showed, you know, again, lots of people don't realise on what resilience this band had to show to keep going, because, yeah. you know, there were so many things out in that final five years, you know, it had those misfortunes not, you know, befell them, it would have been a very different story, um, you know, we're never going to know what would have happened had some of the things that went on um, hadn't occurred, and, and they would have carried on like they had done in the 70 to 75, and they just were on a breeze, you know, it was just right. everything... You know, they were top of the world. Uh, but in a way, the challenges that they, you know, that they met and had to go uh, has only added to the legacy and only added to the challenges that they took on. And, and you can only, uh, you know, stand back and say, wow, you know, the fact that they even got out there again you know, after what happened to Robert and everything was an amazing thing. And it says everything about the camaraderie of Led Zeppelin, which we saw a lot of. Right. You know, there was a lot of humour about Led Zeppelin. They had a great time. Not not just with all the drugs or sex sure. or whatever. They, just, they were just great guys who got on right. in an English-type way with English humour. I mean, the whole I thank you thing, which... Yeah, Robert I was just going to ask you that. about that. There was a lot of little one-liners, like, you know, references to football and the whole I thank you yeah. thing. Where did that come from? Well, again, again you know, being, being on tour with Led Zeppelin, it was always... Um, like what was happening now so when we went over the european championship soccer was on and, and you know england got knocked out fairly quickly so i, I remember robert coming on stage uh, you know and saying oh shame england couldn't make it they beat spain but you know it's too late now so there were things like that and then 
the whole I thank you thing was was very much um, Robert always had these sort of things if you go back to 77 it was badge holders you know in Los right. Angeles <laughs> where everyone was dubbed a badge holder and then a joke would go around the tour you know and, and everyone would clue in on it so the I thank you thing was something that I think he'd heard where he lives in the Midlands, someone kept saying it. It was an ask a It was a guy called Arthur Askew. Was a comedian in England in the 1930s and 40s. Used to say it, and it it was so typical of Robert to pick something up like that and transcend it across the tour. So every time he went into a hotel or saw Robert or he greeted someone, I thank you. you know, and, and then <laughs> someone else would say it, and then you know, even Jimmy say it. You know, it was like right. it, it just went round and round and round. And again, that was just a whole camaraderie humour and everything that is in Led Zeppelin, which doesn't always come out, you always think it's this, you know, bloody hammer the gods thing that's going on, and right. it wasn't, Led Zeppelin were, had great fun, you know, and, and with, within that, they were able to make great music because they were relaxed and, you know, there was a chemistry and camaraderie that made it easy to do what they did, you know, together on stage so well. Right. Listen, if you're uh, just joining us, we're talking to Dave Lewis. He is the author of Feather in the Wind, Europe 80, and it's the uh, it, it's the chronicle of the final Led Zeppelin tour, and um, Dave is the preeminent Zeppelin guy, so if you're just joining us, you've really missed a whole bunch of good stuff. <laughs> Dave, I wanted to ask you, um, the tour ends, and uh, the guys go away for a little while, they plan this short u.s jaunt that they're gonna mm -hmm. that they're gonna slowly turn into a bigger deal and then uh and then the, the the sad news happens in september that that bonham dies uh where were you when you heard that well that's pretty ironic as well um my magazine cyber loose the fanzine that i wrote um mm -hmm. i had written a ten thousand word piece on the tour the day before um this is September 24th, I had written the final parts, um, you know, the editorial, saying that Led Zeppelin were up and running, and by the time you read this, they're going to be in America, and, and all of that. So uh, I signed all that off, and I was in a dialogue with Swan Song to go and see them rehearse the next week in Bray Studios, right? I, I, I had spoken to the publicist, and, um, you know, I was trying to liaise that I could get down to Bray the next week mm -hmm. um, and that could well have come off and I remember uh, I've still got a notepad that I'm writing down all these sort of details for this phone call which would have been the week of it when he died and uh, I was all set to go so I was at home and uh, I had a call from a fan um, in the early evening saying they'd heard that John had died and I said it, it kind of happened I'd spoken to Swan Song earlier that day I'd, I'd been online to them telling them that I was going to bring my magazine in when it was published in the next couple of weeks and I was just well I was shocked completely and then on the news on the radio news it, it came through and I always remember thinking if it's going to happen it's going to be a lead story so that the news started and it was right. you know the usual mundane stuff and right at the end the very last story we just heard John Bonnell being found dead and it was just like oh my god and it was well, at the time, it just seemed the end of the world, because, you know, sure. it was my world, you know, and we all had a period where we had to dust ourselves down, I guess, and, and try and, you know, get some semblance of order, and so, I, you know, the, the next few days were, were a bit crazy. I, I, I did think of going to the funeral, but I, I, I really didn't, in the end, I wasn't really strong enough to do it. It was a long, you know, it was a long time ago now, and yeah. I probably should have done, but I know fans that did go. And I was in touch with Swan Song, and they, they were great in telling me that you know whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I think they were, I think they were so shocked within the band that it had happened as it happened. Um, and were they going to carry on? Weren't they? I, I right. think there was an element that they could, but what, what, there was also a loyalty that they couldn't. Were you when? A few, after a few days had passed, you'd gotten a chance to get your druthers a little bit. Did you really think Zeppelin would continue? I mean, what was your what was your initial instinct? Well, again, this is something in retrospect, and many people have told me this who are close to the band at the time, is that there was talk of bringing someone in, but because of the loyalty they had, it, it, it couldn't happen. Right. But I think, looking back now, in retrospect, it, it could have happened, they could have done it, and somebody could have come in, and I think in a modern age now, it would have happened, because of <laughs> the way business is, you know, it, it, it would have happened, but I think, again, it said everything about the fact that, you know, this was a huge business, and it meant a lot to Atlantic Records to have Led Zeppelin functioning, Sure. so to not have them functioning, 
you know, was you can imagine how much money, you know, that went out of, you know, that whole sort of business, if you like. So, yeah. But it wasn't a business decision. It was a loyalty, out of loyalty for what they were. And I think also they obviously felt that the chemistry they had could not be repeated. Now, the Who... Um, did carry on when Keith Moon died right. um, and you know proves that there was life after it was never the same I think Led Zeppelin could have gone on it wouldn't have been the same but it, it possibly could have done but the climate at the time particularly within the band I think was that it, it was over and I think again Robert amongst more than anyone probably was tiring of it I think yeah. you know I, he definitely had some difficult days as we know and I think for him it, it might have been a slight relief um, you know, and he, I think he has said that he went away um, and, t- and just felt, you know, there was a, it was a bit of relief in a way, and, right. and, and he could now reinvent himself. You know, in those early, there were some very weird days, eighty, eighty one, yeah, eighty two. I... You know, he went on tour with the Honey Drippers. Right. You know, I, I remember being in a club in Retford in uh, Nottingham. You know, this was like six months after, and. You know, from being on stage in the biggest stages in the world, you know, Madison Square Garden, Elf's Court, wherever, you know, is Robert in a club, you yeah. know, playing R&B stuff, uh, and no one dare mention the words Led Zeppelin. You right. know, it, it, it just, you know, every time I saw somebody bring an album up for him to sign, you know, he wasn't that enthusiastic. I mean, that would come much later. It, right. It's incredible how now it, it's such, you know, a revered thing, but, you, you know, there were some weird days, in, you know, and then... For a while, I can honestly say, Led Zeppelin became pretty unfashionable, and that sounds like a crazy thing to say, but particularly in England, where, you know, suddenly, as I said earlier, these new bands had come forward, and, you know, the likes of, you know, Rush and people like that, and Death Leopard Iron Maiden, took their audience, really, and, and for a while, I think up until Live Aid, you know, Led Zeppelin's stock was, was not high, and their legacy of, you know, influence didn't come till later. In America, it probably stayed similar but in I can tell you in England it, it didn't really come back until some of the newer bands uh, you know like the Cole the Mission started to right. name check them and then you get to the you know 1985 and Live Aid and then it all slips back in and from right. then on no one's looked back you know Led Zeppelin have been you know one of the iconic rock acts and will continue to be forevermore yeah. but I, it was weird days very weird days yeah and I think one of the great things, one of the many great things about this book, and I really enjoyed it, uh, to tell you the truth, and one of the great things is that you really you really, as much as you chronicle the tour, you really get into uh, sort of the nuts and bolts of what happened uh, in the death of John Bonham and sort of the the ramifications that happened after that. And it's it's fascinating because I certainly got the impression that it felt like there wasn't a chance this band was going on. It felt like that uh, they were devastated, and like you said, it, it, it was almost an excuse for Robert to get out. That's sort of that's sort of the impression of some of those interviews. Yeah, I, 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 get, I think you know Jimmy Page didn't want to let go of what was his, really. And, and again, <laughs> all these years later, you know, he's still you know the keeper of the flame. But I think mm-hmm. it was they weren't strong enough, really. I think to to, to to go on because to bring someone in you know it would have had to have been you know more rehearsing what rap or and, and uh, I mean you know John Paul Jones has said you know how could I play with another drummer after playing with John Bonham at, at that point you know he's obviously gone on to play with loads of drummers but at right. that point you've got I think you've got to remember the um the situation for them and, and uh, there's something else that's quite pretty evident over this period that the death of John Lennon came the week they announced um, that they were not con- you know continue as they were as he said in the statement and this statement came on December the 4th and then on the 8th Lennon got shot and wow. the Zeppelin news of them splitting up almost got buried because right. of the Lennon death right. you know that's again that's another weird thing that happened whereas it would have been major news it almost got put under the carpet because obviously this incredible death of Lennon was you know obviously such a news story but uh, that didn't help I think in in like um, in sort of grieving Led Zeppelin nobody got the chance to say it's over long live Led Zeppelin whatever you know suddenly Lennon had died and the whole you know particularly in America you know it was it it cast a gloom and 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 things went on you know a bit like you know the sort of Kennedy thing you know when the Beatles came over everything got brightened up a bit but for a while, I, I think, you know, the whole Zeppelin thing just got, you know, almost, you know, evaporated and people forgot 
what had gone on. But don't forget now, and they didn't forget um, after a period, but as I say, I can only describe it as a, as a very weird period. It was like, as I say, someone taking the rug away, because everything had been so good, and everything was ready to be good again, because, I, you know, having seen them in Europe, I did feel that there was a long way for Zeppelin to go. You know, lots of things I think would have had. I think there might have been solo albums. I think they may have, you know, done solo projects, but come back to Zeppelin. I think right. that would have been a way, a bit like, you know, maybe Genesis did at that time. You know, I think there would have been a a situation where they would have been freer they wouldn't have been tied to tour album tour album and that would have worked and they'd have done selective gigs and gone to Japan or wherever but all speculation which again you know is part of you know the fascination of this of this whole band it right. really is. And, and it's and it's fun as a fan to, to sort of speculate you know what would have happened what would a set li list have looked like on a, <laughs> yeah, on know, a future it, tour what would the what would have the career path been like would they have you know gone on to re reclaim you know the throne you know all, all of that's fun but the one thing uh, that I wanted to uh, sort of wrap things up because we're, we're gonna let you go in a moment but um, obviously over the, the course of the last uh, 30 years years um you know there's been very little activity there was live aid there was the uh the time when jimmy joined robert at nebworth there was the the atlantic show and then of course in 2007 finally there was uh what can be called a, a led zeppelin show albeit with, uh, sure. with with jason i'm assuming you were there i was absolutely there what was what was your take on it and do you think well, we'll ever see it again well, okay. Well, what, what's fantastic about it was it was done for Armet, it was done for Atlantic, um, it was done for all the right reasons. Um, they rehearsed intensively. You know, Robert's quote, it's a fantastic quote, we need to do one last great show. You know, that, that is a terrific quote because the Led Zeppelin story at that point did not have a happy ending. It, it, you know, it was cut off in its prime, as I've just been talking about, the right. rock was pulled. And there was, you know, a, you know, Live Aid was great for the atmosphere. Atlantic SCA didn't really work. You know, they'd, they'd done various bits, and, and they needed to sign off. You know, and, and they needed to sign off in such a way that people would always remember. Now that night, December the tenth, two thousand seven, they had a lot to lose. They had their whole reputation on the line. And I can tell you, I felt nervous if i felt nervous i'd imagine the eighteen thousand people felt nervous and the four people about to go on stage were nervous the fact they pulled it off so successfully so convincingly again says everything about led zeppelin because all right you know it wasn't the real led zeppelin obviously when jason uh, you know when john died um you know that went but it was in spirit and in everything else it was led zeppelin jason did a fantastic job so what's great about all this is that they can walk away and say that's what it was like that how is how good it can still be that set of songs can still you know turn that into you know a mass celebration of great music and they could walk away with a you know relatively happy ending it, it, it was done of course what that did is also made people think well if they can do it one night right. surely we can have more and that right. the you know the pressure to go on again for robert plant more than anyone was to do more now yeah part of me says that would have been great um but when you get to the, the 40th reunion gig it, it doesn't have quite the ring of the first that's and I fair think it, it, you know i think in the end would it have become another big reunion tour uh and then in a way you know um lessened you know the sort of legacy so it's from I, I guess my take at the time was that if they'd have done another five gigs one in new york one in los angeles one in England, one in Japan, whatever, you know, selected gigs and then done it and walked away. That might have been... But the more they'd have done, the more demand they'd have been. And, and I know Jimmy wanted to go on, and, uh, and I know, you know, they got together with Jones in, and, you know, right. Jason did some jamming, and there was talk of a new vocalist. And But in the end, you know, it's died down. You know, the it, what we can say is that on that night, we can walk away with, you know, the ending. The ending of right. the Zeppelin is a band who could still, after... 30 years get on stage um and the whole halo effect of the o2 people are still talking about it right. people are still waiting for the dvd to come out exactly it will never go away you know what and that it? just you know adds to the legacy and i felt a tremendous surge of pride and still do every day about the fact that this band can cause that and right. i was very lucky to be in the middle of it and i'm still writing about it and i'm still um, and still and passionate speak. about it. Yeah, I'm absolutely. And still, you know, the fact that you get young kids who weren't even born when I was watching them in Europe 80, 
It says everything about the legacy of Led Zeppelin, which will go on as long as people listen to music. Right. It just will. And exactly. I feel incredibly privileged to have been part of that and, and can still be part of that. And to tell my story and continue to chronicle it with integrity, which, you know, is a word I always use in anything that I try and do. And I'll continue to do that. Beautiful. Yeah, so in, in, a, in, in essence, it wasn't a reunion in 2007. It was a swan song. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it was a... It was a chance for everybody to say, this is what we did, and this, we can do it again. Right. Um, you know, and maybe we can't do it again every time, because, you know, we've all got stuff to do. And, you know, again, but I think central to that is Robert Plant, who has had this amazing career. He was, at the time, on a high with Alison Krauss thing. He's now gone on to the Band of Joy. Robert, in effect, doesn't really need Led Zeppelin. Um maybe jimmy Page does or, although you, you know you're going to hope that jimmy's got new music to make and uh, and i still think he has you know there and, and then you look at what jones has done with you know them crooked vultures you know i mean the, uh, the thing is again the, you know all those guys are still doing this stuff and jason with black country community and the whole led zeppelin thing is always in the present tense i always say we're not talking about something that's in the past led zeppelin lives and breathes every day in, in many people's lives across the world in different ways you know right. and it's all about that amazing catalog of music that was made between 1968 and 1980 uh, and, and that's you know as i say something that lives and breathes the whole time and it and it lives and breathes in uh, dave's new book zeppelin feather <laughs> in the wind over europe 1980 dave we want to thank you so much for joining yeah, us let me just tell you where um, people can get the please book from please it's, um, please at my website www tblweb.com uh, if you go on there that's the type of this website and you can get the ordering details uh, via PayPal, um, and that's how you can reach this book. But if you're a Led Zeppelin fan, I think you would uh, get a lot out of it. And uh, it's true. it certainly tells the final days of Led Zeppelin. Perfect. Well done, Dave. That was absolutely uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for waking up early and doing this with us. We Man, really, really pleasure. appreciate it. Uh, if there's one thing I like doing, it's talking about Led Zeppelin. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I really love the show. It's great. Um, Thank yeah, you. I, I, you. You're obviously very much a demographic, you know, sort of demographic of I am, and you you like the same bands as you know the sort of thing I do. You know, it's yeah. the Who, the Stones, the Beatles, yeah. all that stuff. You yeah. know, from where uh, from where it came, and the whole Zeppelin thing, you know, was carried on because of that. I think so. Really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, thank well, you, Dave. I, I thank you. I, I thank you. <laughs> I, I, and I, I thank you, um, <laughs> Dave. Have a good day. Yeah, just just one thing. I tell sure. you, this is going to be online. Can you just drop me the link? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll take care of you tomorrow. Yeah. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah, yep. so I can um, get it up on our site, and uh, obviously I'll give you a plug, and no problem. We'll keep in touch. Sounds great. Thanks, Dave. We appreciate the time. Have a great day. And you, mate. Bye bye. Bye. Wow, that was great. That was good fun. He's he's the real deal, man. Absolutely, that is that is a Zeppelin talk about fan. being in the right place, though. You know, yeah. he, he obviously obviously a fan, but he mm -hmm. was there. Yeah, he was in the Swan Song offices. Yeah, he was going to the shows. He was hanging with Led Zeppelin. It's amazing. Really, is amazing. It's amazing. Well, and uh, and tonight has been fairly amazing. And it's amazing that we only have about four and a half or five minutes left in the show. And I know we got some business we got to take care of on the road. And uh, we're going to get our 70s rock on in a big way in just a few minutes. Right. Because we're going to be talking with Dave Lewis, the uh, leading Led Zeppelin aficionado, I the will say, and amazing. historian. He's he is amazing. He's unbelievable, this guy. Uh, and his new book is called Led Zeppelin Feather in the Wind Over Europe 1980, which documents the In Through the Outdoor Tour, which was their final tour before John Bonham's passing. We're going to get to all of that shortly, but right now, to put you in the mood, Oh, very nice. <laughs> that was uh, Led Zeppelin's Achilles Last Stand from Mannheim, Germany, uh, the final Zeppelin tour uh, in 1980. And the reason that we were playing a little bit of that is because on the line with us is the preeminent, 